So thank you everyone for joining us and thank you to all our facilitators here for bringing the information to us today. We are recording the session. So uh, if you would like to share after the fact, that's wonderful. We'll have it on YouTube, on our YouTube channel later on, hopefully today. If not, it'll be there tomorrow morning. And then we'll also email uh, information out uh, post-session as well. Um, so good morning. I'm Brenda McClellan with Traverse Connect. I'm the Director of Investor Engagement, and I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers today. And we're going to begin with Mandy. Uh, Mandy Sutherland uh, is a senior consultant with 25 years of experience working with clients, architects, and designers globally to develop a common understanding of corporation, corporations' issues, uh, worker needs, and work experience solutions. Mandy specializes in creation of new work experiences with drive increased organizational resiliency and the amplification of individual and team performance. Currently based in Toronto, Canada, Mandy <laughs> has led a variety of engagements across Northern Michigan, um, North America and Europe with uh, public and private corporations across industry sectors who are attempting a moderate or high degree of change. Mandy speaks public, publicly at various businesses uh, and design events and on issues related to change management, culture and changing nature of work. Mandy is a pro sci certified change practitioner. I'd love to know more about that, Mandy. She has a VA in psychology from University of Windsor, Ontario and completed the program for managing strategic change, University of Toronto. Rotman School of Business. I'm going to pause and admit some people here. That was a very, I should have sent you the shorter version. I'm sorry, Brenda. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that information. It's always nice to know who's uh, speaking who's with us speaking. today. And we also have with us today, Isabel. Oh my gosh, we, we practiced this. Medellin. Medellin. Did I push you? <laughs> there we go. Yes. Um, Isabel is Director, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and Talent Acquisition at Steelcase. She has over 20 years of experience having worked the last 12 years with Steelcase. She has had the opportunity to lead global, multicultural, multi-generational teams. She has served the company in talent management roles, as well as in the business side of sales support areas and managing director of their global business center located in Monterey, Mexico. Isabel is from Monterey, Mexico, and five years ago was transferred by the company to be based in Grand Rapids, where she lives with her husband and two children. Mm -hmm. um, Isabel has a Master of Science in Strategy Management and Leadership by Michigan State University and Bachelor of Science in Business Admin Administration by UN UANL at, in Mexico. Um, she speaks Spanish and English and has knowledge of Italian and French. And then finally, we have Nikki Probst. Nikki uh, leads business relations and marketing for the Custer, Custer family of companies. Um, together with the companies, um, she builds a holistic integrated environments through strategy design, furniture technology, and flooring services offered by businesses throughout West Michigan and Northeast Indiana. With the partnership of informed decisions around their space, Nikki works closely with area architects, interior designers to educate on Custer companies, capabilities, and industry shifts to support inspiring, engaging spaces. So today uh, we are going to begin with Mandy. And uh, Mandy, thank you so much for being here. Great thing. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. I am really excited to share with you some of the research that we've been doing over the last year um, around this forced experiment and um, also the research and then how we've leveraged this research to help clients try to figure out what next, what should we be doing? And it's been a really exciting time. I'm part of this applied research and consulting team. So we're always trying to look ahead into the future and, and understand how to kind of help clients apply the research. And um, from a psychology background perspective, it's, 
it's ex exciting, it's scary, and it's all new. So um, I'm going to share with you some of the research and what, we're, what we've done with it. Now, Nikki, I believe, is going to be monitoring the chat. So if along the way you have any questions, please feel free, send it. Um, also, I'll try to stop at a couple of points and ask if there's any questions, and then we'll, we'll have left time at the end. Um, so I am going to share my screen, and hopefully it will not blow up. And let me just see. And then I just need you guys to tell me if you're seeing my presentation view or whether you're seeing my notes view. Notes view. All right. It's different in Teams. Okay. So here we go. Perfect. Everybody can see? Okay. So um, the the uh, work better research, the reason we called it work better is through the research, we really discovered that what people were looking for was not to come back to the same environment that they left, but they wanted to come back to something better. And what's really interesting in this as well is that um, they are different. So they're looking for a different experience coming back. The people that you're going to be welcoming back to your environments are very different than the people that left. So obviously, the pandemic really forced everything to change. I mean, in a lot of corporations we talked to, literally people only had the opportunity to pick up their bags and leave. Some people took their computers home with them. Some people took their chairs home with them. Most people just literally ran home and they had to very quickly adapt. And um, we did uh, a lot of studying on a global basis and everybody was experiencing something a little bit different. So what we decided to do over the course of the pandemic was to really study um, what was going on, what were people experiencing, you know, what were the user sentiments, the people's sentiments as they kind of moved through COVID, because we really felt that um, this would definitely influence um, what their expectations were when they came back, you know, the, the kinds of relationships they were having with, the, with their coworkers for their leaders. And we really wanted to understand that in order to understand, to, to help inform, you know, clients about what are the environments, what are the things around return to work, and also what are the kinds of products and applications that we needed to consider to help clients as they brought their people back. Um, so we did, we looked at this on a global basis because different countries were going through different things at different paces. And a lot of our clients or majority of our clients have global presence. So they, we thought it was really important. And we made a commitment that we were gonna take a real database science driven approach as opposed to what was the latest trend and what was popular in the moment. So we really, we went deep and we went broad and, and we touched 32,000 different people to get this. And, and we continued on. I mean, this research that I'm sharing with you is a culmination of up until I would say winter. And we're continuing to do research and we'll continue to bring those learnings to the marketplace because it's going to continue to change. Um, I'm still in lockdown. You folks are going back to work and you're, and you're losing your masks, but we are still in lockdown. So everybody's experience is a little bit different. And as I mentioned before, what we learned was it's not about going back to what people left. They're looking for something better. And a lot of organizations, what they left um, was not necessarily a great experience. And the, the time at home, as you'll see, has really influenced their feelings about going back in a number of different ways. So the first bit of research, research I wanted to share with you um, is all about the work from home experiences. I really like this body of research because it's really speaking to um, the, the impact that working from home has had, <clears throat> not just from a physical perspective, but from a psychological and a social perspective. I mean, this is the grand social experiment. So we did a study where we wanted to really understand the work from home experience from people around the world. And we, we created this, these five archetypes to represent the experiences. They're kind of the extremes and no one person will probably fit into one, but they're really meant to describe the experience versus an individual. So the isolated Zoomer has felt very, you know, they're typically someone who might live alone. Um, they're in back to back to back to back meetings all day long. They have a really hard time of having that, that stopping point and often it creeps into the evening and they're feeling very um, overwhelmed. They feel uh, they miss the social 
isolation and, and despite the fact they're looking at people's faces all day on camera, they just don't feel connected. And, and I'm sure you've all experienced this with these back to back to back meetings, everything feels very transactional, very um, task focused, and there's very little socialization. So this person's really, this, this kind of archetype is really struggling with that and really misses that, that face to face. Conversely, the autonomy seekers have really enjoyed their time at home. They love the freedom. No one's breathing down their back or their neck. No one's telling them how to work. There's been this sense that trust has been extended to them for them to figure out how to get it done in their own rhythm. And I've been hearing some really interesting stories of even call center people who in the office were, were very um, micromanaged in a lot of ways, but at home, they kind of had to take ownership and figure it out. And, and they're feeling a real sense of satisfaction with their work because they've had to figure it out on their own. But the autonomy seeker, what they have really liked is the mixture of personal and professional. They can duck out at lunch, take the dog for a walk. Um, you, you know, if they work better at night, they've been able to do that. They can open a window. They can, you know, give themselves a snack uh, throughout the course of the day. And so this particular one is going to be the hardest to bring back because they're, they're seeing all the, the benefits of it. Now, conversely, the frustrated creative networker is really struggling because the virtual meeting technology isn't allowing them to do what they need to do. It's still too limited uh, for the kind of creative co collaboration that they need to, to do the work they do. Um, and they miss the ability to connect informally. Now, people are connecting informally, but it's within a very um, specific network that they've created. They haven't been able to do the broader network. They're not having those serendipitous encounters, and even their, their um, social time is often very structured. So they, they are, while they appreciate some flexibility of working from home, um, they're really struggling to, to do the kind of work they need to do um, from home. The overworked caretaker is definitely something that's um, very much a pandemic archetype that hopefully will become resolved afterwards, but they're torn between balancing the work plus uh, kids, aging parents, whoever they're taking care of at home. So it's really hard for them to, to kind of do their work during a, a specific eight hour day. And so they're feeling guilty, they're feeling taxed, they're burning out. And then finally, the relieved self preservationist, they've really enjoyed working from home because um, they are maybe the type of of um, group where their organization hasn't appreciated them or there's a toxic environment or maybe the the constant interaction over the course of the day is just mentally and emotionally exhausting for them so they really have appreciated working from home feels more human to them um, so again this is meant to be extremes but the reason it's very interesting is that these are the things that are going to influence these experiences are going to influence what people want when they come back to the office based on what they've experienced now for what the last 14 15 months um, this is this is a muscle coming back to the office is a muscle that hasn't been uh, activated for quite a while and it's a significant change so this is a, a moment for organizations to also recognize that bringing people back to the office is also a huge change management moment the return to the office needs to be orchestrated carefully because people have been away for so for many organizations people have been away for so long it's another big change so let's chat a little bit more about, you know, what people liked and didn't like. What was really interesting um, is that in all of the countries that we studied, nobody misses the commute. Everybody's like the fact there's no commute. It's bought them extra time, you know, time with the family, maybe time to work out, time to, uh, time with the, you know, to 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 really get organized. Um, that is the number one, and it still continues to be the number one thing that people are struggling with, and what they one of the reasons maybe deterrence for not wanting to return to the office. Um, what was really interesting too is some of the things that people liked and didn't like were the same thing, and it ended up on both sides. Like this whole idea of being able to focus and be productive. And yet people have also said, the longer I'm staying at home, the less productive I am, especially those people who are doing the creative work, who are just tired of looking at the same four walls um, for the last year and a half, which would be me, as you can expect. So there's some interesting things. Again, 
that leaders need to pay attention to when they're thinking about the work environment that they want to bring people back to. Um, focus was something that people complained about uh, before the pandemic, but has become an even bigger issue, as you'll see, coming back. Because at home, they've been able to control their distractions. They've been able to control their availability. It's going to be harder to do that in, the, in a lot of the environments that people left. And culturally, um, there's been this in a lot of organizations. It's this always on mentality. So when we ask leaders around the world, kind of what are, what are, you, what are you planning on doing? Are you thinking everybody's coming back? Nobody's coming back? Is there something in between? We found that the vast majority of organizations were thinking about a hybrid strategy, sometime in the office, sometime at home. But there's a vast array of time. And each organization was thinking about it a little bit differently. Interestingly enough, um, a small portion of the population, like at the time, 23% were saying everybody's back in the office. And we're seeing that with some of the larger creative organizations that they recognize the value of, of everybody being together in the office for those, those um, unscheduled, unplanned moments of, of, of learning, of, of um, creating culture. And then there was a small portion of people that uh, organizations rather that were thinking full-time work from home. And we're seeing that with some, um, some organizations um, are thinking that, that nobody needs Needs to come into the office but we've seen from it'll be interesting to see what happens because in the past when that happened um, some large organizations did that and then ended up bringing everybody back because they found that there was a loss of of um, um, a loss of engagement and people were leaving regardless um, we did hear from a lot of organizations that this was an opportunity, a pivotal moment to really take a step back and rethink, what are we doing in our workplace? Maybe this is an opportunity to rethink. And we love this, this quote from McKinsey because it kind of encapsulates that, that idea of this is a moment where we could take a, a step back and reinvent the office. Um, and especially if no one's in the office right now, a lot of organizations are taking um, the opportunity to, to, to make some changes before people actually return. Um, the saddest thing we ever heard was from a designer who said, oh God, I just wish everything could go back to the way it was, back to normal. And you know what? This That's kind of sad because this is an opportunity to say, how do we make it better? How, how can we be better as an organization? Because if you really truly believe that space is that large artifact of culture, then if we really want to enhance and build and grow our culture and our capabilities, this might be the opportunity or the moment to think about how we leverage our workplace to do that. So moving forward, um, actually, I think I might have even, so moving forward, um, we, we kind of did a, a deeper dive to say, okay, what do people really need and expect from that work experience? How do we use that to think differently about the workplace? And what are some principles that organizations can think about in terms of designing their spaces differently? And again, everything I'm sharing with you is in directly related to everything we learned. So in terms of the five things people need, it was really interesting. Um, one of the top things was safety. Now, pre-pandemic, safety was not something that we were hearing a lot about beyond, you know, there were some companies that were very safety focused and they'd have safety moments before meetings. Um, and a lot of them tended to be more of the manufacturing type organizations. But overall, a lot of organizations weren't really thinking about safety beyond ergonomics, but it be, it's become a really um, big topic in terms of mitigating disease. And again, this some of this was um, really, really big still in the fall. But I'm, you know, speaking to some folks, uh, speaking to companies, there's going to be residual effects, even after people have vaccinated, there's an awareness now about, you know, disease and, and the mitigation of, of um, bacteria and um, things like that. Anyway, the other issues, belonging, productivity, comfort, and control, they've always been around. But this whole last year and a half has really amplified these issues and made people really um, think about them more than they might have in the past. So I'll share a little bit about each one with you because I think that it really does start to inform how you begin to think about not only your workplace, but your return to the workplace strategy. 
So if we think of safety, um, the top, these were basically on a global basis, each company, or excuse me, each country had a slightly different order, but it was pretty darn close. Uh, unequivocally, everybody was thinking about air quality and having, uh, and, and that isn't something necessarily, unless you had really poor air quality that was really part of the discussion. Um, safety protocols and facility cleanliness continues in the surveys that we're continuing to do with clients who are interested in understanding the sentiments of their workers and what their expectations are coming back. Um, these three things, air quality, safety protocols, and cleanliness continue to be the top three. And physical distancing and, bound and density is also top of mind right now, especially for those organizations that are bringing people back before everybody's vaccinated. Um, the desire to belong, to be part of that community is huge. Everybody talks about it. Um, this idea of feeling connected to their organization, to their peeps, their people, their tribes. We're pack animals. We want to feel a part of something. And people want it. Uh, this is something we felt was important, not just a feel good, but something that really had definite business benefits. So um, what we decided to do was because community was such a big deal, such a big topic, we thought we would measure it. And so we thought about the metrics of community being about purpose, belonging, resilience, trust, and inclusivity. And so we measured it. And what we discovered was that there were definite correlations to business outcomes of productivity, engagement, retention, and innovation. So the higher the scores were on those community metrics, the higher the scores were on those business outcomes. So that's something really important. In the past, we would think community was a nice to have, but not necessarily business benefit. Um, now it's recognized that it is definitely important. And so the way we, we think about um, um, the attributes for community from a workplace perspective, we found was the presence of leaders, whether leaders were present and accessible in place, and, and perhaps even um, in um, digital as well as physical space. And then this idea of having social spaces where people can come together and, and environments and experiences, not just, not just the environment, but the experiences that happen in the environment were really um, stimulating and, and promoted ideation and creative problems solving, which are definitely important for businesses to be successful. Around productivity, this was interesting to us as well. Not everybody has the same work from home experience. Okay, there are some people depending on the country you're in, depending on your social strata, uh, you know, financials, the whole bit, um, who you're living with, you know, whether you've got kids or parents or you're sharing an apartment with five other people in an urban center. But we found some really interesting um, statistics that showed when people did not have a good work from home experience, engagement and productivity both dropped. And the numbers varied. They were much greater in some other countries. In Canada, actually, the numbers were higher. Um, so this is something to consider when, if you're thinking of people continuing to work from home for large chunks of time, um, ensuring that there's a, there's a positive work from home experience. It'll also be a driver for people wanting to come back to the office. Productivity also, from, an, from, from our perspective, was interesting because um, when we asked people why they wanted to come back to the office, um, we found that the ability to be productive was critical to both leaders and employees. And by prod productive, people want to collaborate and be able to focus. Now, the reason we think this is very interesting is through these discussions around working from home and wow, we know we can do it now, there was some discussion around should the office be solely focused on collaboration? Well, the reality is people can't collaborate at eight hours a day and it's not always a scheduled thing. It just sometimes happens spontaneously. So the ability to be able to focus and collaborate in the office is really critical. The other thing we thought was, was interesting to note was notice the leaders are thinking not just about work process, but they're also thinking about organizational issues like expanding networks, hosting clients, talking to leaders. They're also thinking what's critical is um, onboarding of new employees. Employees themselves are focusing much more on what's good for me, which is, um, you know, accessing tools, feeling like I belong to the team, and then the focus and collaboration. So that's something that I'll chat about a little bit uh, later in the, our conversation. But this idea of when you're making 
de decisions about your hybrid work strategies, you need to definitely consider the needs of the users and the individuals, but you also need to consider what's right for the teams. What do the teams need to be productive and successful? And what does the organization need? The organizational needs, which sometimes um, supersede or are, are individuals might not even think about. You know, they're thinking about what's good for me, but the, the organization's thinking about the greater value that individuals bring to the organization for the organizational success. Comfort's interesting too. I mean, pre-pandemic, we talked a lot about ergonomics. People, you know, are, are concerned about physical comfort when they come back to the office. And that's something to be, you know, uh, consider not just in the office, but at home, because when people are uncomfortable, they're less productive. But people are also concerned about um, the, the cognitive and emotional side of comfort, which is, can I focus and concentrate when I come back to the office? You know, can I have that feeling of safety and protection when I need to? Can I feel connected to the organization's purpose? Um, the strongest organizations are the most successful are the ones that people really feel connected to the values of the organization, the bigger, you know, the bigger picture, the bigger kind of um, aspirations of the organization. So people are looking for that. They want to feel part of something bigger than just the tasks that they're doing. And control. This was a big big point of discussion. Um, at home, people have had a lot of control over their experience, for the most part, um, good or bad. And um, in the past, they haven't necessarily had that in the office. Some organizations, they have had no real choice and control. People have one place to work and then when, you know, in a workstation and then there's offices. Other organizations have really tried to move towards either activity-based work or providing more choice and control so people could go to different places to work. Um, but they haven't necessarily been able to control that environment um, like they have been at home to some degree. The other thing that's really interesting and continues to evolve is this idea of how much time people want to work from home. So having that control to say, do I come into the office or do I stay and work at home? And it's been interesting to see that um, the longer people are, for many anyway, the longer that they are working from home, the long, the more they want to work from home because it's become familiar. It's become something they know. And coming back to the office is something that I'm not quite sure about anymore. And, and what does that look like? And what does that feel like? Um, but again, going back to what's right for the team and what's right for the organization needs to be part of that. The other part of it is if people have left a toxic environment, if they've left a very um, uh, antiquated, static, sterile work environment, then of course, coming back to that is not gonna be super appealing. So these are all things to consider when you're thinking about bringing people back to the office. It's not just about mandating it coming back. They'll come back if you tell them to, but will they do so willingly and will they, will they exhibit passive aggressive behavior if there hasn't been a good job of communicating and then letting people know what's different. So out of this, um, Mac, we've seen kind of like four macro shifts. And I'm just going to go back. Sorry, I'm going to pause here before moving forward. Are there any questions? Because I will just keep talking. Are there any questions, comments, thoughts before I move on to say the so what? What do we do with this? Annie, that's so much information that you've shared, but all of it is quite interesting. And um, some of the responses to the survey that we sent out before uh, the meeting are lining right up with, with the results that you've had with yours, yeah. Yeah, so you're, um, I was looking at your responses. So you had 50%, 50% um, of the, the respondents said uh, there'll be a mixture of work, work and home, so a hybrid strategy. 30%, 100% at the office, 10%, 100% at home, and 10% not certain yet. So that's in, that, based on the size of the population, that's pretty close. And what was interesting too is this engagement piece. 50% of your respondents said that engagement has actually decreased. 30% said it stayed about the same. And then 10% said it increased and 10% not sure. I would also propose that do companies really know? Have they made the effort to go out and, and uh, collect data around the sentiments of their users 
and um, what their expectations are for returning to the office. Um, I think that's a big opportunity um, to get closer to the ideal solution if, if you're able to do that. And know what, you're, know what your employees are thinking, not just take it from the perspective of the leader perceptions, but what are people actually thinking and feeling? Tony, I see you came off of mute. Love your picture, Tony. Uh, that was not intentional, my bad. Okay. <laughs> okay. We do have a yeah, question you... in chat. Sorry, Nikki. No, that's okay. I knew you were watching it too. And I think it's interesting too, because I've talked about this a lot with leadership at Custer, but Rob, <laughs> Rob mentions or makes this statement almost, are people as productive from home as they think they are really? Maybe. And that is the million dollar question. Mm -hmm. So people might think they're productive because they can focus and concentrate for the most part, right? They can control the distractions, but are they doing the kind of work that the organization really needs? So remember going back to those archetypes, a lot of the work that's going on is very transactional. It's very tactical kind of work. And, and what's really suffering that we're understanding is that more creative work, that more um, forward reaching work, because people, they're connecting with their colleagues, but it typically happens within their intact teams. They're not broadening their networks. They're not diversifying the points of view, which is what you need for creativity, for innovation. So they may feel personally productive because they finally can concentrate, but they're not necessarily doing the kind of work that's needed. So that is a really big clue for when they come back to the office, how do we ensure that they can focus and concentrate. And I'll share with you a couple of ideas there so that we can make them feel um, confident that they will be able to do that. But at the same time, make, help, them, help them to realize, hey, we need you back. We, we miss your face and we need that creative energy that everybody brings and they may not even realize they're bringing. Shall we move on? Okay, I'm looking at your, perfect, thanks, Brenda. Okay, so let's talk about the so what, so what's next? So this um, research led us to kind of make some, um, led us to these four big shifts. I'm not gonna spend a huge amount of time, but I just wanna call them out. Four big shifts in the way leaders and organizations are thinking about buildings and the, work, the workplaces. So, you know, Safety and safety standards, health and safety. Yeah, that's definitely, that's table stakes is what we've always thought about. But now there's this thinking around, do buildings need to be smarter? Do they need to, do we need to be thinking differently about um, the, the systems and, and the, the, um, the way they operate? Um, you know, how they're designed, how tall they are. Do people need to ride elevators? What's going on in the, in the, um, the, the shared uh, spaces, especially in urban centers where you might have multiple companies sharing the same building. And, you know, we've created our circles of trust at home and now we're extending it to our workplace. But, but what about all those other people I bumped into on the way up? And, and, and thinking about productivity, you know, we used to think about space as, is that this particular space productive? And, and, and is the person productive in their individual spaces? But now thinking about it much more broadly about multimodal spaces and can, can the space do more than one thing? Can it be really um, flexible and productive and, and, and adjustable? Um, are spaces inspiring? And, you know, if people are coming back to wanting a sense of community, wanting to be um, uh, connected to the organization, wanting to be inspired, you know, um, it's, is it, you know, we used to think about aesthetics. Is this a sexy looking building? Is it great colors? But it, is it, you know, in, now we know it needs to be much more than that. It needs to be much more holistic around that. And then finally, this idea of flexibility. I mean, we build buildings for, for longevity. We, we bolt as much in place as we can because it makes it, it's more permanent, it's easier to manage. But if this pandemic has taught us one thing, it's this ability to pivot quickly as an organization is gonna be critical for business continuity. So our tools and our environments, you know, being able to flex and pivot quickly as well so that we in turn can pivot quickly. So these are some 
some food for thought around macro shifts we think are really important moving forward, and some design principles um, that we think will help to um, um, articulate uh, to support these macro shifts. Um, we've, des we've kind of identified, the designers have identified four design principles, and I'll go into some detail about each one and show you some examples, because regardless of your industry, regardless of the kind of work that's being done, there's some universal things that um, out of this pandemic that have led us to think that these are the, the, the types of principles that need to be exemplified and translated course for each organization and Nikki will share with you how they've translated these into their own environment um, to make to make it a great work experience so people can be productive and that they can do the kind of work that the organization needs them to do. So if we think of this idea of me and we, um, in the past when we build work, work environments, a lot of organizations started with the me, start about, started thinking about the individual spaces and then whatever was left over, we, we basically created these collaborative spaces. But if the, the reason people are coming back is to work with other people in a lot of cases, um, this heavier attention to the we and then balancing the me and the we is going to be even more important. And when we think of the me, if people are concerned about the ability to focus and concentrate, maybe we have to spend a little bit more time thinking about what that looks like and providing a greater range of options. Because in the past, um, it, it was either a private office, a close the door meeting room, or you could hope to heck that you had high enough panels that you could focus or you had headphones. But you know, the, the privacy is gonna look different um, based on the different kind of ways that people are interacting with each other. So privacy could be about focus and concentration, but privacy could also be doing a video call at my desk. So the other the important thing to think about is the quick shift, uh, being able to flip back and forth be between focus and concentration, which is a me, to our collaboration, which is a we. And, and collaboration hopefully is not just scheduled collaboration, but also those opportunities for quick and quick sessions that we're not getting working from home. So having to travel across a building to get to a, a, a we or a me space is not very productive for people. So being able to mix these spaces together and make it easy to toggle back and forth will be really critical. And, and thinking about privacy, not just acoustical, but maybe I don't need complete acoustical privacy because it's really nice to overhear what the team's doing, but maybe it's just visual distractions. So thinking about privacy in a range of from uh, uh, um, a, a perceived privacy to a buffer to a boundary to a barrier. So thinking about that um, in, in, in degrees is, is really important. And so this is just uh, an example um, of some different options here where you can see everything from shielding to um, enclaves that people could go into and, and kind of um, sequester themselves for a period of time. This idea of fixed to fluid is really interesting too. Again, historically we've built for permanence, but this idea of if we wanna pivot quickly, if we wanna support not only things that may be controlling from the outside, but our ability to move more quickly internally, um, having more flexibility in the office is gonna be critical and also more user control. So not just facility level control, but can users um, shape their environment? Because again, they've had some degree of control over that at home, open a window, move something around. Granted, it's not been great in a lot of cases, but there's that sense of control. So thinking about things like, um, uh, having spaces do more than one thing, being able to quickly shift it from being a learning space to a collaboration space to a library space where we can be alone together. It'll be important. Um, having devices, like if we're going to do more of this hybrid work, meaning some people could be in the office and some people could be somewhere else, um, do we always have to go to a Zoom room or is there the opportunity of, create, of making that the technology more flexible and fluid and also enabling us to gather around it more easily? So these are just some things, technology and power being more easily accessible so that I can work anywhere in the building. The next one is about open and enclosed. Now, this is interesting because you'll notice here that not all the collaboration spaces are open and not all the individual spaces are enclosed. Um, there's some sentiment that people right now, especially in the short term, are wanting to be less enclosed with other people and may want to be, when they're collaborating, maybe be more in the open. But there's also this idea that 
um, it, in creating more of these open collaborative spaces allows team size to, to kind of um, ebb and flow and, and have um, the ability to, again, pivot quickly. It's going to depend on the kind of work that the teams are doing. Um, and also, people often think about, yeah, but what about noise in the open? Um, being planful around having higher elements in between, like having enclosed spaces that buffer open spaces so that you can control noise, thinking about things like what's on the ceiling, what's on the floor, what's on the panels, what's the traffic pattern. So um, the ability to adjust based on size, thinking about degrees of privacy for collaboration, maybe some work does have to be totally private and other types of work. Um, maybe there's some benefit, especially if you've got agile teams, as in agile development teams um, who are doing sprints. Um, Overhearing each other is not a bad thing. Overseeing what others are doing is not a bad thing because that's how you learn. Um, I would say that for anybody. Um, so these are just some thoughts around, um, you can see some of the call outs here. Um, having uh, spots, again, blending this idea of me and we um, in the open and enclosed um, is really important. And then this one is really important. We were dealing with it a little bit before the pandemic, but now, of course, as we move into a more hybrid environment, um, people have always been working remotely to some degree with most organizations, but this has become amplified. So where pre-pandemic, we might have had five out of six people working in the office and then the one person calling into the meeting and by the way, having a horrible experience because everybody would forget they were there, would talk over them, have the sidebars, be writing on the walls, and they're like, what about me? But the reality is, if we're going to have hybrid environments where we might have half the meeting is remote and half the meeting populations in a room, there's definitely spatial implications to that. There's definitely technology implications, but there's also behavioral and process implications around how to do hybrid meetings. So from a spatial and technology perspective, you know, things like um, having the larger scale content. So it's funny, somebody said to me from an IT department, you know, if we were calling into a meeting, we might have had the, the less desirable experience. But think about it. We each now have our own monitor potentially our own microphone, our own camera, right? But if I'm in a room with a bunch of other people, we might be sharing a monitor, sharing a microphone, sharing a camera. So this idea of thinking about the experience of hybrid meetings and how do we create equity, presence equity, how do we make sure everybody feels like they've got a seat at the table? Um, there's gonna be definitely some implications to the size of the, the um, you know, the, the virtual devices. Uh, so, sorry, the, the video devices, how you orchestrate or organize the room, the view to the camera, maybe how many cameras you've got, how many microphones. Also thinking about the shielding because not every virtual connection will be happening in a room. If you're the person connecting in and you're connecting from the office to another office, you may not need to go to an enclosed room. You might just need a little bit of shielding and you can grab your laptop and go to one of those um, kind of high top tables to do a, a short meeting. So there's a lot of implications here to, to take a step back and really think about the experience. Also thinking about, you know, what we can do in the open environment and having more mobility to these devices. Um, it's, it's really been, it's going to get even more interesting as organizations start to think about this braiding of physical and virtual. We've been doing um, some research and observation watching people. And even though you might be providing the large virtual, excuse me, video um, monitors in rooms, we're also seeing people using their personal devices in these rooms. So you might have the meeting going on on the big screen, but people might also have it going on in their laptops. They might be using their phones. So you need to think about how to support personal devices in these team meeting spaces as well, because, and that's going to continue to evolve. So this idea of flexibility and the, bil the ability to incorporate evolving technology will be important because obviously the tech industry is going crazy thinking about what can we develop to support hybrid work. So being able to host that new stuff, that hardware will be important as well. Okay, I'm going to take a breath and ask if there's any questions before passing the baton to Isabel to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. But um, 
what resonated with you? Uh, what are you struggling with? What questions do you have? Whether it's around the environment, about working from home, whether there's, there's some really interesting discussions that could be had about leadership and how do we lead differently. There's discussions going on right now about meeting culture, meeting uh, hygiene, you know, how to do hybrid meetings. Um, there's a lot of interesting discussions going on right now around how do we determine who can work from home and how often and at what point is it not good for our organization? Drinking so that I can answer questions. Anything? Okay, well, thank you for your attention. I hope some of this, now please know that there, Mandy, we are, yeah. Mandy, Jill has a question. Oh, good. Sorry, I was trying. Hi. Hi. I, I, I wanted to get just, I, I, I was trying to ask this question back when we stopped last time. And um, so I'm going back to the productivity question again, but yeah, have you, in all of this research that you've done, have, has there been any uh, companies that have actually been able to kind of measure that productivity output during COVID versus pre-COVID? Yeah, uh, I would say the companies that have had an easier time of measuring productivity are companies that were measuring productivity before COVID. So if they are the kind of organization that's measuring the number of calls people make or the number of widgets that they get out, agile teams, of course, they're always measuring velocity. So they've been able to do that as well. Um, but for the most part, Jill, a lot of companies, uh, their, their so-called measurement has mostly been, how does it feel? Do you feel more productive? Do leaders feel, you know, and again, it goes back to that comment somebody else made around my definition of product productivity as an individual versus the organization's definition of productivity. So I would say this much yeah, <laughs> that helpful. we've seen. Yeah. And then, um, Maybe this is what's going to happen next. So maybe I'm getting putting the cart before the horse. Yeah. But as I'm look, thinking about all of these things and I'm looking at all of your sketches and everything, all I can think of, I'm a very operational person. Sure. And how I can think of is how do we make this happen? You know, yeah. and so, yeah. you know, in terms of logistics and how do we yeah. get people involved and how do we, what's about, what about budget? And is it supposed to be perfect when everyone comes back? And, you know, all okay. of those kinds of questions. So I'm going to give you a couple of thoughts. And then, of course, definitely Nikki and the team are available for you guys to help you through it. But a couple of things. Will it be perfect? The one question that people always ask is, what is everybody else doing? And what are the best practices? So right away, we can say, ha, there aren't any because everybody's in this moment of experimentation. Will it be perfect? I will tell you right out of the gate, no. And organizations have to get comfortable with that, that they are in a moment or a period of testing and experimentation. The best thing you could do is to think about piloting, taking small, you know, think about what are some things we want to test, measure, iterate, and then then once we feel like we have a point of view, then, then go more broadly. If you don't have everybody back in the office right now, it's the perfect time to start doing your planning don't wait until the gates open right i know they are in michigan um i'm understanding the masks and everything and even in our own corporate headquarters they're starting to you know um expect people back we were inviting <laughs> we were encouraging now we're moving into expecting people back but um of course with flexibility but i would say if this is a moment where you can experiment with different things. The other thing I would say is understanding the sentiments of your people and understanding their experience and what they've learned. How have they changed? Um, you know, you might find that there is, people have learned new skills, new ways of, you know, teams have maybe created new rituals and new practices, you know, understanding what those are and being able to support that back in the office. Because if, if, if they have evolved and then you try to bring them back to a toolkit that represents how they worked a year ago, they're gonna struggle. So I would say understanding your organization, what's changed, understand the sentiments of the people, and then starting to think about what could we do to pilot and test some assumptions that we have, and then use that as also a communication device. I would say 
if you understand, if you start to understand what our environment should be, then you could take a step back and say, okay, what do we got? What do we got in our, uh, in our toolkit? What can we reuse? What can we repurpose? Some organizations are using this time before they bring everybody back en masse to make those changes in the workplace so that they don't have to do that horrible swing space thing where they have to move people, right? That's, that's a nightmare. The other thing I would suggest too, Jill, is when you're putting together your hybrid strategy, know that there are some leaders who are going to determine their hybrid strategy based on their personal preferences. And that, and, and there are some leaders who are not comfortable with leading people they don't see 100% of the time, sit in that desk so I know you're working. There are other leaders, in, even within the same organization, that have said, you know what, we figured it out. I trust my people. We've got, you know, processes in place um, that allow us to kind of connect with each other. I've got measurements in place to know whether people are working, not working, doing the right things. I am comfortable with people either um, having the choice and control on campus or off campus. So I would say one of the things that I believe firmly is you need to come to some level of, of, of alignment at a leadership level as to what your hybrid strategy is going to be and how you're going to determine who is in, who is out. Uh, because the worst thing, and the, the, the equity issue, you do not want the haves and have nots because that just takes people's eye off the ball. You want them to have them on. There's going to be a lot of passive aggressive behavior and too many conversations around that. Another one, Mandy, from uh, from Jonathan here asked, did your research address communication or coordination losses with this concept of braided engagement settings? Uh, not sure I understand completely. I think what he's referring to is, is specifically that design principle about braiding technology and presence. Has yep. there been any loss in, in um, communication specifically? Okay, gotcha, gotcha. I'm sorry, I thought you meant in relationship. Okay, so... What we found, interestingly enough, is that during the pandemic, leaders were extra, extra, extra diligent, diligent about staying connected to their people. Um, in organizations where the leaders were very visible, virtually, and accessible, and were constantly checking in, they had very high um, engagement rates. Um, those organizations where leaders were not, the engagement was a lot lower. Um, where they uh, leaders uh, companies where leaders have created a cadence of staying connected to their people um again it it, it was um they, they probably had the more more positive outcomes i would say what's really interesting to me moving forward and so you'd also don't converse the other you know conversely the other is true um what will be really interesting to me is when people come back to the office will leaders slack off on that Will leaders feel that they don't necessarily need to stay as connected? So one of the things that we learned from our research, which I didn't share here, is during the pandemic, people have experienced a much higher degree of empathy from their leaders, from their coworkers. There's been a, a level of, I don't want to use the word intimacy, that's not the right word, but more uh, authenticity. There's been a lot more authenticity. Leaders have kind of been more approachable in a lot of ways. I've seen my boss with a bad haircut and we've all been wearing t-shirts and things like that. So there's this new level of re relationship and authenticity. I think you need to think about how's that gonna change when you go back? All of a sudden, those leaders that were super conservative before and it were very transactional, are they gonna go back to being that way? What, what's it gonna do to their people? When they go, wait, where was the boss that I had for the last 14 months who cared about me and, and knew what I was going through and kept me updated in terms of what was going on in the organization? So I think that's another conversation. How are we going to continue to keep people connected? Because just showing up in place is not going to do it, right? Unless you're creating experiences, if you're engineering experiences that allow that to happen in place, um, I think people are going to struggle. So being very intentional about those things. And, and um, so the physical virtual braiding piece, as people continue to work from home, you're going to need to continue to do that. Find ways. The more people work from home, the more you're going to have to work hard to keep them connected. And then if people are coming in not as often as they did before, maybe it's three days a week, maybe it's four days a week, maybe it's two days. How do you make every moment count that they're in there? Because they're not in there five days a week. How do you ensure that they're having the experiences 
that will provide them the learning, the the um, the development, the awareness, the creative. Uh, friction that needs to happen, the, you know, uh, understanding the corporate vision, living the corporate values, all of those things don't just happen, right? It won't just happen anymore. They'll, there needs to be some intentionality moving forward. That's my change management hat. And really good question here from Kevin too, because I think the topic of hybrid has been more and more evident even since this research has been released, but he says we're working on and having internal discussions regarding our go forward hybrid home and in office work strategy. A big item we're discussing is what constitutes an acceptable at home work environment. Okay. So it's interesting. Um, that will depend on the values of your organization and how much time people are working from home. So if people, um, if, if people are working a lot from home, like three, four, five days a week from home, the need for ergonomic comfort is greater than for somebody who's touching down and working periodically at home. At the very least, if they have a comfortable chair, that they can adjust. I mean, working at your dining room table once in a while is not a bad thing, except if you have to work there eight hours and you're up like this. So at the very least, an ergonomic chair, a lot of organizations are looking at that. Um, for And then as you start to increase the amount of time at home, things like monitors become more important. Uh, a, you know, adjustable height work surfaces, right? So that people can work standing up which they can do, <laughs> sorry, a little bit of a product placement there. Um, so the other thing too, that'll be important to understand too, is if someone's working a lot from home and you, you know, video uh, bandwidth will be critical. And I, and it, maybe it's not a big issue in Northern Michigan, but in some of the countries, like I Isabel will tell you, Monterey, big issue. And maybe even in some of the, the country kind of regions within Northern Michigan, um, beautiful by the way up there, um, it will be an issue. So you need to think of bandwidth, you need to think of ergonomics, and then um, how you scale it up will depend on how much time people are at home, as well as the kind of tasks they're doing. If they're in and out of meetings a lot, it's maybe ergonomics is less of an issue for them as opposed to somebody who's strapped to their table, desk, whatever, on a, mon on a computer, doing coding. I mean, that is, is death for someone to do that at a dining room a table at an Ikea chair, right? So it's, it's, there's no one right answer. It's, it's degrees of, of um, uh, how long you're having to sit doing one thing and then how long you're spending at home and go from there. And then the other thing you need to consider is who pays for it? Is it a, is it a stipend? Is it a, you know, steel case and, and Custer create programs for organizations um, where they get really deep, di you know, they get good discounts for employees to take advantage of. So the employees get the company discounts. Um, it could be something where some companies have said, well, we're going to have fewer individual spaces. Not, we're not getting rid of them, but because we're going to have that flexibility and we're going to share individual spaces when we come back in. Some companies have said, hey, we can send chairs home, you know, that we have in the office. Let's repurpose those chairs. Um, the other thing you need to consider is also what do you do when the person leaves? You know, do they, do, do they own the asset? Do you own the asset? So I'm just saying these are all things that are part of the discussion, but that's something definitely Custer can help you guys with in terms of figuring out what that looks like. Gosh, I hope these long answers are helping and I'm not <laughs> tiring you out. <laughs> Thank you. That's all that came in. Um, that's all that came in for now. So we might want right. to. Um, I will stop sharing and pass the baton to Isabel. How do I stop sharing? There we go. Thank you, Mandy. That was um, all helpful information. Great. I'm so glad. Oops, I'm sitting down 30 slides. Can you see my screen? Great. As Mandy shared earlier, uh, one of the top things that people need is belonging. And to make that happen, we need to work proactively and consistently 
on diversity, equity, and inclusion. As company DI, as we call it, is part of our DNA. Since the steel case was founded, one of our core values is treating people with dignity and respect, and we are a human-centered company. We put people at the center of what we do. It, certainly last year challenges um, made us reflect on our strategy and identify opportunities to be better at it. Then we have three main uh, commitments uh, or goals and our aspiration is to uh, advance diversity, equity and inclusion through building diverse teams that reflect our communities ensure equitable development opportunities, and last but not least, create a culture of inclusion. But what does it mean for us? We are working on different um, initiatives uh, uh, to support this. In building diverse teams that reflect our communities, we have two main areas of focus. One is inclusive recruitment. This means that we are very intentional uh, with our talent acquisition team to expand diverse networks of talent. And also we have added resources to our team, such as diversity recruiter to help us to build this partnership and relationship with this diverse network of talent. And once that we have access to this diverse pool of talent, the other main initiative under this building diverse teams is implementing an evidence-based selection process. Over a year ago, we partnered with an organization named Higher Reach on bringing a more structured approach to conducting uh, interviews and selecting people. Then this inclusive recruitment and evidence-based selection are a, a core part of uh, advancing uh, diversity. Related to ensure equitable development opportunities, uh, our um, talent analytics teams did a research about how we can advance women uh, and minorities uh, across the company. And uh, one of their findings is that there are like three preconditions for success. One, you need to have senior leadership commitment. Two, you need to make talent visible. visible. It's not possible to develop talent that you don't know. Then creating this visibility is very important. And last but not least, creating opportunities. Then once that you have this talent visible, you must ensure that we have the talent management uh, conditions for advancing them in, in their careers. And uh, about creating a, a culture uh, of inclusion, we want to improve different uh, uh, practices and, and policies and evolving our learning experiences. To share an example with you about some of our programs or policies that we have reviewed, one of these is our harassment prevention uh, policy and also a training that we have shared across all the company with leader and employees. And it's not about the policy, it's, it's, it's beyond that. It's about reinforcing the company commitment to a culture of mutual respect and also take it as an opportunity to reinforce expectations with all of us uh, as employees, which is fundamental uh, to support this culture of mutual uh, respect and create this sense of belonging uh, to. About different uh, learning experiences that we are creating, uh, yes, we have uh, different programs for uh, leaders, for our talent team, but also we are creating uh, different experiences uh, for our employees. Uh, for example, uh, last year we launched um, something that we call a SPAR Critical Conversations Fund. Then any employee can apply for it and get some resources um, to co-design with us. Uh, could be a lunch and learn or a workshop something uh, that will be uh, meeting that unique needs uh, for a group or, or a location. Also, we have a representation of different business inclusion groups, such as Gender Equity Network, Pride, and uh, more recently, uh, uh, we launched a DEI Champions Program or a Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion 
Champrons program that is anyone in the company, leaders and employees that wants to, to join and, and work closer with us in, in different DI activities. And this could be by providing insights or advice or, or helping us to co-design something. Then there are different things uh, happening. Uh, but when we think about diversity, uh, that goes beyond our workforce. Uh, we think about the potential talent. We think about our supply chain, how we can make a positive impact in our communities and um, in our customers. To share with you an example of things we are doing uh, with potential uh, talent, uh, we have been uh, refining uh, our internship program and identify ways uh, to be more intentional on tapping diverse pool of talents. And I am very glad that this year, you know, our incoming intern class, 78% uh, are from a diverse background, could be Asian, Black, uh, Latinx, women in STEAM, international. And this is key for helping us to shape uh, the future uh, of the workforce. And also, we are broadening our definition of inclusion. Then we want to support our customers with new design principles, with workplace guidance, uh, with toolkits uh, for engagement and ensuring that we have this uh, diverse perspective uh, in, embedded in everything that we do. Then this is you know, a very high level, uh, what we are doing in DEI. And before passing it to Nikki to expand on inclusive design and what Coster is doing, do you have any reactions to this or any questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. So, you know, back to kind of, yeah, um, what Mandy was saying and now this, when we're creating these environments, mm -hmm. um, how do, okay, so I feel like in some ways we're sort of recreating the culture of the office, but are we, uh, you know, when we're talking about these physical spaces, how do we also make sure those spaces are inclusive of our, our that, diverse, increasingly diverse workforce. So, you know, I think about, you know, an open workspace where you can overhear people, um, maybe culturally, maybe some cultures that's not, accept, isn't an, an acceptable practice. You know, you're trying not to hear, listen to people, you know? So I guess I'm just kind of thinking about, you know, how do we create these spaces to be like what Mandy was saying, they're new, but they're also responsive to cultural norms um, to accommodate all the, the diverse workforce that we have. Yeah, I think that that's a great question. And I wanna share a couple of things and also ask Mandy if she wants to jump in on this. I think that is very important that we listen and understand our people needs, you know, and also that we have visibility of these different cultural norms because something that could be, you know, a, a norm or a common practice in Americas it probably could be received in a very different way in APAC. You know, then we need to provide other type of settings or spaces to create that connection. Then I think that is about having a clear understanding of that cultural uh, differences and needs and provide um, the flexibility in our products and services so our customers will have this choice and control. Mm -hmm. Mandy, anything you want to add on this? Beautifully said, Isabel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think there's something interesting too. So if you think about North America versus other offices, for sure, how do you translate those mm -hmm. principles mm -hmm. um, for the other locations and countries? But even within a let's say North America, uh, in, in any organization, it's a mixture of um, local culture, but also the organization's culture. Because mm -hmm. you know, an organization's competitive advantage is their organizational culture. So there may be there may be a little tension sometimes around um, I may not want to be overheard. But the maybe the organization in some cases needs me to be because 
others will learn from me because I'm a senior person, I'm a mentor or a coach or whatever. So I think having that open dialogue and trying to find that midsection. And to Isabel's point, you know, if people don't want to be overheard, giving them choices or options of places to go in the office to not be overheard, for instance. But I think there always has to be that balance of, mm -hmm. um, yeah, the, the flexibility and balance to to support not only the individual, but also what it what does the organization need to be successful? Mm -hmm. I don't know, Isabel, if there's uh, if there's uh, an un, unmeetable friction there or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, Nikki, you will say something. Oh, no, I don't want to interrupt you. I was just going to add on to that point because you can it. just build off of that for sure. Just talking about in building an inclusive environment as well. I was just talking earlier this week just about the idea. There was um, a study, and I think it was someone from Steelcase that shared with me that women have a lower percentage of people that are wanting to go back to the office, whether that's due to their caretaking responsibilities that they have at home, or maybe they don't feel as safe in the office. Um, also like the Gen Z and the younger generations are experiencing a higher level of depression than older people in this pandemic. They're the ones that are craving more connection. Mm -hmm. So thinking about those different demographics and groups that might feel different about coming back to the office and considering that in your environment, because mm -hmm. we don't want to go back to just as an example, a workplace that's just all toxic men or <laughs> you know you you want all of your um your departments all of your people all your representatives um having equal equity in in your space and there's things that you can do and questions you can ask to experience um that and learn from that a little bit differently that's just all i was going to add <laughs> yeah no that's a, a great example thanks for for sharing yeah for sure. a any other questions related to diversity equity and inclusion. No, nope. doesn't look like there's anything else coming in, but okay. feel free to hop in. As okay, we then I, for now, yes, I will stop sharing my screen uh, to pass it to Nikki so she can expand on inclusive uh, design and what Coster is doing. Can I just put in a, a plug for, for the whole equity and in inclusion piece? Wherever you can engage your employees mm -hmm. in the dialogue, wherever you can not, you know, get them working together to think of solutions um, or working through issues. I think there's huge value in that. And then whatever you decide to do with that output, help them to understand how you've translated it and leveraged it. Because it may not be in exactly the way they'd anticipated, but if they can understand how and the why, um, that really helps as well. Mm -hmm. And if there's anyone on, on the call today interested in some research that we put together at Travers Connect surrounding DEI and what that looks like in the workplace and how, it, um, how research has been done to show that there's more learning that goes on, the, the bottom line expands, as well as your ability to attract talent um, is, is uplifted when you have a more diverse and equitable work environment. Mm -hmm. awesome. Thank you, Isabel. Thank you. Yeah, well, Brenda, I might just kind of keep going and wrap it up here for my panel of colleagues. I think when we were um, talking and, and kind of planning through um, what we were going to discuss today, we thought it might be beneficial for um, you guys that are participants to kind of use Custer as a case study uh, for, for what Mandy has shared and what we're going through uh, currently. For those of you that don't know um, Custer or our industry really, Custer is a partner of Steelcase and we use a lot of the research that Mandy has shared just to share with our clients on a more local level. So if you're purchasing any of the products that support um, the research that Mandy is discussing, you would go through Custer to do that. Our main headquarters is also in Grand Rapids, Michigan, but we have representation up in Traverse City, uh, people that are dedicated. Um, we work at a 20 Fathoms up there in Northern Michigan. Um, and we work with K through 12 schools, uh, universities, corporations, and small business, especially um, in that area to just really find out what all these concepts mean for you because none of this is a one-size-fits-all approach. So we try and decipher all this information and our own team of designers and change management specialists 
is asking questions on what your business issues are, what your business drivers are, um, and how we can really use space uh, to make some of those changes. So we're, we're excited too, because I think that a lot of um, decision makers and leaders are asking those valuable questions right now on how does space impact my environment. So, and we don't just sell furniture. I shared this slide just so you guys know the partners and services that we have um, under our umbrella of companies uh, that Brenda mentioned that I referenced present Custer, C.S. Erickson, and Century collectively sell full integrated space. So we're going through design strategies as it pertains to furniture, and especially with this increase of the use of technology integration, C.S. Erickson is our technology company that has really, really helped us um, understand what that investment and return can be of increasing your video conferencing technology and what you have in um, your own space to give people equal equity, whether they're working across the conference table or across the town or across the country um, integrating that technology. So as we were going through the last year of also working remotely, we uh, took the time to survey our own um, employees and really understand what was working for them and what wasn't working for them and take um, steel cases research and information that Mandy has shared as well as feedback from our own employees and we looked at ourselves as an example and made changes. We made the investment um, to shift our own workplaces and reallocate the real estate that we've been using to dedicated individual workspace uh, to work a little bit differently for us as we're coming back to work in the next couple of weeks here. Um, I shared with Brenda and some of the survey questions that I think that she sent to you kind of the categories that we focused on when asking our employees how they were doing um, on our cadence of constant communication asking them questions specifically around their mental well-being, how they were doing at home, what they were missing from the office, what tools they didn't have, what could we incorporate from home more in our office to encourage them to come back, um, how their productivity levels were, just asking them what do you need to do your job better, whether that's at home with an ergonomic solution or a height adjustable desk, or at the office when they come back, what technology do they need to do their job more effectively, and then culture, that was a huge component and will continue to be because we saw this disconnect that we were trying to avoid um, from employees just feeling disconnected to the purpose of our organization. So, you know, what can leadership do to make you feel like you have a higher level of belonging, um, both at home and in the office when they come back? So those were kind of the things that we surveyed around. And then when we went and looked at our space, we took steel cases design principles and kind of adjusted them for our own smaller business and our work environment. What do we really want to do and incorporate um, in our office to encourage people to come back? I'll pause here and say that we are in the integrated space and office furniture industry as well. We want people to come back, but we will also be coming back in a hybrid schedule. So there's going to be this need for flexibility and we wanna create a space that people want to come back to that's almost better than home. And a big part of that is harnessing home and hospitality, right? So we don't wanna forget the fact that you are 10 steps away from your kitchen or you know the, the great things that you have at home that make it working great for you. Uh, we wanna incorporate those things into an office environment. And that's really important to make people feel welcome, to make people feel safe and make it less corporate and more comfy, I say. Um, so we really were intentional about doing that, making it feel more like home. Um, supporting teamwork and me work and embracing technology and togetherness are very similar to um, steel cases, kind of design principles there. And I'll show you some pictures of how we're really integrating and changing those spaces to do so. And then flexibility is the future, both in hybrid work styles and giving users choice and control over their own workstation. So making it really easy for people to either get up and move from one place to another or more mobility in the solutions that we have at our office. So you can push them around and you don't have to rely on a facilities team to make changes in your environment. You're putting that control in the hands um, of the user. So let's dive right into it here and I can show you kind of what we did. This is a, a bit of a floor plan, plan and I'll get into some photos of just different spaces um, that we allocated to different zones of work, very similar to the steel case renderings. Um, we also, we, um, earlier on it was mentioned, 
the concept of using pilot spaces. And this is something that I really want to drive home with our employees as we're returning to the office, that these photos that I'm sharing, we're not anticipating that this is going to be um, a be all end all solution. We need feedback from people. And how we've chosen to do this is create this space that we are calling a pilot space. And we are communicating to everyone that we took your feedback and we made changes to our environment based on the feedback you gave. And it's going to continuously change. So that QR code that you see on the right there, um, we're encouraging both business guests and employees to give us feedback on what they like and what they don't like about the space anonymously. Um, I'd be more than happy to share the survey that we have, but essentially when you scan that code, it asks if you're a guest or an employee, and it goes through like a series of quick questions to capture feedback. And then it goes to our change management specialists and our design team to use that feedback to make changes. Um, for our business guests, it's asking, you know, what was most impactful to you and what are you taking back to your organization? So that's kind of our way of collecting feedback in a means that we've all gotten very used to with QR code menus <laughs> or making them visual throughout our space. Um, and this message real quick, when we're talking about culture and messaging, we created kind of a theme for 2021 at Custer. Um, unlearn, reimagine, transcend that we've kind of tried to driven home as part of our core values with our employees. And that just really means that we need to work collectively um, to unlearn past processes and understand that we're going to be working differently um, and reimagine how we can work better um, and just transcend this time of the last 14 months of 2020 and be better organization and more purposeful in what we do. So I'll get right into it here. Um, this is our area that previously had a reception desk. So many of you, when you come into your, your buildings or your facilities were greeted by a receptionist. We've shifted and put that um, responsibility of greeting guests or walking into an environment um, in, in the hands of our employees or the managers. So now we have a big table that we can have an introduction when we walk in. Um, you're greeted by the person that you may be meeting with right away. And to the right there, you see a video wall. Um, if I was able to show that kind of on a bigger scale, it rotates part of our history, our core values, what we do at Custer. So we really invested in some digital solutions that greet you right when you walk into the space um, and just shifted some things around to make it a very open environment that leads into our living room. Um, these are some of the technology solutions that remained unchanged. So we have some video conferencing um, tools in our closed spaces that allow for heads down work and teamwork. So you can step away and have a two person meeting or a larger eight person meeting in the conference room on your right there behind closed doors. So as you'll see, as I continue to flip through these, this is a very open environment, but it was important to build in those ratios of closed spaces where you can have collaborative meetings, close a door. These are reservable spaces that um, you can have a meeting and, and collaborate, which is a big reason why you might choose to come into an office space. This is just another view of that particular conference room that is actually, um, we use sensors to see how people are using our spaces. This is our most used space. Um, in our current environment because of the technology, the analog communication tools on the wall, um, and just the privacy of this room provides here. And here's some before and afters. So when I talk about um, reusing our real estate and just really changing how this floor plan was, uh, this was before the pandemic, a space where our administrative and IT team sat. So it has the most access to natural light and these were people that were sitting butts in seats eight to five every day. Um, so we gave them great natural light, but they had big dedicated workstations that is just where that one person was sitting all day. We needed to really look at how we were gonna change that space to accommodate more users that might be working in this hybrid work style and coming and going. So we changed that space to some of these spaces that you'll see, just touchdown spaces that you can have social interactions and um, quick conversations, um, as well as some workstations that have great access to natural light. Here's one of our um, HR admin conference rooms that was behind closed doors. And we understand that those spaces to take private phone calls are still very necessary, but we're opening things up and going from a, a brick and mortar drywalled conference room 
to a solution like this that is a pod. And there's various solutions that we offer that make a more flexible solution. This can actually be disassembled and reassembled in a matter of hours. It's not stick built construction, but it's a pod that gives acoustical um, privacy in an area you, um, real estate that was just a pass through before. So we're using these transitional zones to put a private space um, outside of our open areas. Here's another example of a IT workstation that was just a panel system and we open it up where that TV can be used to share content. You can have a different posture that's more casual and four people can collaborate by the windows. So completely changing the use where there used to be just two workstations. This is now an area where four people can meet together. More admin stations that were dedicated workstations, we've changed to um, workstations or desks on casters. So this is actually a Steelcase Flex product that can be easily moved throughout our space. It can be shifted to um, be perpendicular to the window. Um, and you still have a place to have dedicated heads down time, but you don't own that workstation anymore. So that's a big change for us at Custer. We had nameplates on every workstation, and now we're moving to more of a hoteling hybrid um, work style where we are giving people the technology at that desk. You see that external monitor to come in and plug in their computer. So there's no favoritism on any desk. You're provided with the same technology, no matter where you choose to work that day. Again, another view of workstations with some conference settings behind there with some um, demountable wall systems. We've opened up and made more workstations that can be easily pushed together to make collaborative pods to have an agile work setting, or you can push it up against a wall um, or a window to meet together. Uh, you'll also see that we have a lot of greenery elements in here. We were talking about productivity earlier, um, and this is a principle that we brought in more so in this space. Here, I'll go back to this picture. These panels are actually movable, but we've incorporated some artificial biophilia um, into our space quite a bit. There are some studies that show that there's actually a 15% increase in productivity when you have elements from nature um, brought into your space. And I don't know about you guys, but there were times during the pandemic that I'd work out on my porch or by a window. I have a lot of potted plants in my house. So we were trying to bring nature in a lot more to make people feel like they have a safer, better mental sense of well-being, um, as well as the opportunity to just have some increased productivity. So that's a very little thing to think about um, that you can incorporate in your own spaces. And again, just more of a conference room setting um, to share content. This is a huge table to have great collaborative sessions. We want people to want to come in and work with different departments and share ideas really easily in an office environment where at their home office, they might be able to get um, work done or heads down work done more easily. And I just want to share this tool as well. This is what we say our favorite new toy at Custer is, um, and it has been a great investment for us as far as technology goes. This is um, a Microsoft Surface Hub, which was actually a partnership product with um, Steelcase that was a great, great way to invest in technology that has video conferencing capabilities. But this is a mobile application. So this is not something that you're buying and mounting on one conference room wall, but you can shift it around. We can take this from our conference room. We can move it up to our design library. And you're providing that same technology where we only invested in one unit, but we can use it through our entire real estate. So it's great that Steelcase and uh, Microsoft work together to make a solution like this mobile. Um, and moving from private offices, this was a past private office application that we had down on the first floor to a beautiful living room. Um, so again, having a different posture that is much more comfortable. There is um, a video conferencing monitor on the wall there. So this is a great space to have uh, collaborative meetings where you can talk to somebody on the other end of the TV screen, but it can also sit up to 10 people in our living room space with great access to light there. So yeah, that is our new space that we've um, we've kind of built out. We're continuing to make changes um, to our own environments, and we're just starting to walk our own clients through that are asking these same questions that you guys are 
on how you can change space to encourage your own workers to get back to better, working better. Um, so we're very open to having those conversations. I just wanted to share this last slide and let everyone else chime in if they if they would like. But both Steelcase and Custer are here to have these conversations with you. If you want us to do a deeper dive, I'm happy to share some surveys that we've done. Steelcase has a ton of material that can help you in creating kind of your own engagement with your own employees. Um, to make decisions on how to move forward. So if Brenda is able to make our information available, that would be great. So you guys can all reach out to us in the future. We also will... have surveys that you can use as well. That'll help. That have been statistically validated and we've used them ourselves with in the research. Thank you for that, Mandy. I was just going to say, I will em email the information and I was going to ask if you are open to sharing the surveys that you provided to your team so that others might be able to, instead of creating, recreating the wheel, you know, uh, implement it within their organizations. Um, and I love the way that you were able to share the before and after pictures of the space. Um, that four person comfy pod section where there, the, you know, the four chairs so you could sit down and chat reminds me of a living room and Seems very comfortable and engaging. Great place for work or space at work. Thank you. Absolutely. Rob had a question. I see it as well. Many organizations organizations suffered great financial unrest due to pan, due to the pandemic. As they emerge and are coming back to the office, what advice or suggestions do you have for organizations with a limited budget, or maybe just don't have a budget at all? Good question. Yeah. And that's really what we're seeing and why I wanted to share that. I mean, we also discuss this with clients that have just different scales of what they're willing to invest financially. And I think it's a matter of getting into what's most important for your particular organization to make those, those, um, those investments. I mean, there's small changes that can be made. And speaking from a customer perspective, we work very closely um, with Steelcase, but there's lots of solutions that can be offered that meet a broad range um, of budgets that can also, you know, we can take these design principles and apply them in different ways for, for different budgets. Um, and, and we can help you by going through those design strategy questions and what your own business issues are to prioritize those solutions. So if there is a budget number that you have in mind, we are always open to having you know, that conversation. What number are we able to hit and what changes can we make um, to fall within potentially a smaller, um, smaller budget to make the biggest impact? So I would just say it would be, it's not a one size all fits approach. It's gonna be an individual conversation and we need to get together and ask those questions to help drive to what's most important for individual companies. It's very feasible though on different levels. Any other questions today? I have a question. I do. <laughs> I'm like the, the question asker. Um, so Nikki, I um, am familiar with an office uh, that has that hoteling st structure. But what has ended up happening is that everyone has their favorite spot and then they just end up going to that same spot. You know, it's human nature, right? And especially with the pandemic, there's been so much change. It's like one thing I can do is everyone goes, you know, there's like comfort in going to the same spot every day. And that's kind of what happened is everyone's gone to the same spot and everyone sort of took ownership of their spot. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of been counter to the whole uh, hoteling concept. And so I guess I'm wondering, do you think that's okay? And if not, what can be done to address that? Yeah. And Mandy from her change management experience probably has some insight into this too, but we've actually experienced the same thing in that space that I showed you. And I think a lot of it is going to be protocol driven and how we can help people understand how to use that space without being bossy about it. Like saying that the protocol drives, you cannot park your butt in this seat for eight hours a day, like, you know, encouraging them to use spaces differently. When we were talking about that space and the different flexible um, desks that I shared, we were originally thinking like, do we make a map of how, here's how you reset the room. So yeah, move things around, but you have to reset the room exactly how it was when you leave. And we kind of moved away from that strategy and we're going more towards set the room for your meeting or your collaborative session and leave it. 
and then let the next group of people um, play with it and see how that works for them and then change it in a different way. So leadership is actually the ones that are stepping up and having to make um, an effort to sit in different spaces and move things around differently and get people out of their comfort zone, but it has to be led by leadership in the organization. So they really have to drive the charge with protocols that are in place. But we've seen the same thing and it's just like a work in progress because I go to the same desk when I'm there and I try and rotate it or move around. We're creatures of habit. <laughs> You know, uh, I have an office space that has pictures of my family, my plant, mm -hmm. my pen holder. So how are you addressing that? Yeah, that um, is another big thing, especially just to Custer, because this culture component has been so huge to us. So not only by the video applications, that's a higher budget thing, obviously, but we need to create zones that represent our family and our culture and, and what's important. So we're actually renovating our um, second floor right now, too, and we've chosen to make a designated um, area that represents all of our families. So I'm working with our employees to bring in photos of their family, of their favorite place in Michigan. Um, we might have some sort of photo contest that people can bring in their pictures or we can print them and actually frame them um, in an area that's a very collaborative zone, right? That's a shared space. So imagine if you're creating an environment that you're encouraging everyone to go work in, it's not a workstation space, but everyone can go there and it's almost like a gallery of photos. So you're seeing Brenda, not only your children and your family, um, but everyone else's too. So one of our core values is family first. So at Custer, that's really important to us that we have these elements of work family and personal family uh, throughout this space. So even if you don't have your framed photo on your desk, we want people to have the opportunity to see it somewhere in the workspace. And something else we've seen um, from other organizations, even pre-pandemic, um, in organizations where people were anchored to space and went to the same space every day or had very little choice and control over the, the work experience in the office, the things they could control things like their pictures, their stuff was super important. Um, and then in, and then what happened was again, observing the behavior is as people became more, more flexible, more mobile, worked in more of a variety of places, became less tethered to space, could go where they needed to go to do their best work. Those things became less important to them. So the tchotchkes and the pictures and things like that it became less important because they start, they stopped kind of identifying themselves as my space. And then they also found other ways to, to take their kids with them or, you know, plants became less of an individual thing and more of the landscape, like biophilia is huge for people coming back. They want to see greenery. And remember we went through, Brenda, we went through that period of time in offices where it was like, wipe it clean, make it antiseptic. Nobody brings plants, but, but, because people have been looking out the window at their gardens for the last year. So that's why Steelcase is really focused on how do we help people, you know, organizations bring that sense of biophilia. But I will tell you, observing human behavior um, in, in environments that have gone mobile or who are mobile, they become less attached to some of those personal items because they have control in other ways. That makes complete sense. Uh I've been away from my office for a year and just went in there last month or earlier this week. And, you know, those pictures were there and I thought, oh, I need to bring those home. So I see them more often. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's true. Well, good conversation today. So um, I'll follow up with an email to all those that registered for today's session. We'll provide contact information for Isabel, Nikki, Mandy. Is that okay? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And then um, if you're open to it, we'd love to share your survey information for those that are interested um, just to maybe save some time. And, you know, thanks for sharing that. So thank you all for joining today. Good to see you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you. Thank